Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you are here for our Thursday morning Bible study. I'm Lisa Turkhurst, and this uh, is Joel Mutamale, my friend, research partner, and uh, fellow worker at Proverbs 31 Ministries. I'm the president of Proverbs 31 Ministries, and Joel Mutamale is d- the director of theological research. Is that right, Joel? Yep. <laughs> Well, I'm so honored to have you once again for this live Bible study. And we're so thankful that you are here for part two of our End Times series that we're doing. Today, we want to incorporate um, uh, just some more verses. And we've titled this Jesus and the End Times because I think there's important verses to look at when it comes to the not just the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, but also the um, second coming of Jesus. And so I'm really excited to have this time with you. Um, First off, let's uh, just acknowledge that we have our regular Thursday morning Bible study that normally meets uh, in person, but they're joining us online. Joel and I teach a Bible study um, on the street that I live on, and um, I love that I have the opportunity to reach my neighbors and do deep Bible study every Thursday. We say deep because we don't do a lot of talking in Bible study. We really just dig straight into the scriptures, but deep doesn't have to mean complicated. Mm -hmm. And so um, I love to take the deeper truths of scripture and present them in a way that makes it accessible, understandable, but also appealing for everyone to go home and continue their own Bible study. But I also wanna welcome all of you who are joining online. So thank you so much for being here with us through Facebook and all the other technological, amazing um, things that we have access to, to help us more effectively teach this Bible study. So, Let's jump right in. Uh, Two other quick things I want to make sure you know. We have our end times reference guide that I think will be really helpful for you. One of my staff members is going to post it in the comments and pin it at the top. It's called the end times reference guide. That is completely free for you, but I think it'll give you the correct spelling of some of the terms, a definition of the terms, and give you an easy way to uh, go back and reference what we've discussed both last week and this week. Um, The second thing I want to do right off the bat is give some, put some vocabulary around our conversation. So when we're studying in time, sometimes uh, it can feel a little uh, confrontational, but Joel and I don't want any of this teaching to feel confrontational at all. Um, We want it to feel more conversational. And instead of offering up our thoughts and our opinions, we wanna come to you and show you where to turn into scripture as you reference some of the end times words, phrases, events that we're gonna be discussing. I also wanna let you know that it is okay. This is the answer to many questions that we got last week. Um, It is okay if you don't land perfectly in one of the views that we're going to discuss. And I know a lot of times people call them camps. I might accidentally say camps, but really if we're going to approach this in that conversational way rather than confrontational way, um, we want to switch that verbiage because I don't want it to seem like we're in opposing camps. Like some are biblical and some are not biblical. Really what's happening here with all the different views that we're presenting is a, a different responsible look at the scriptures that are available to us. So I think it's important that you know um, that we want to make sure to, to just clearly state you don't have to line up squarely with one of these views. You can study the scriptures and say, you know, when I look at this scripture, this is what, to the best of my ability as I've studied and researched it, this is where I land with this scripture, this is where I land in this scripture. Now, typically, as you make those determinations, you're going to find yourself falling into one of three major categories 
There's a fourth one because one of the categories is two different views on something, but you're going to land in one of these categories, one of these views, and that's fine. But even I will admit this to you, and I know Joel will admit this to you. As we study the scriptures, we see great strengths and we see challenges with each one of the views. Mm -hmm. So with that said, let's just say that our purpose of our discussion today is really to take a look at the scriptures and to um, study the scriptures responsibly and then inform you how the different views think about these really crucial scriptures. Just so you know, some of the places that we're going to be turning today, if you want to write these down so you can have um, the ability to find these in your Bible, we're going to take a serious look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Matthew 24, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, Revelation 20. And then just as a little bit of a set up to really answering the question, how is Jesus going to return? What will happen when Jesus returns? We're going to take a look at Ezekiel chapter 39, uh, specifically focusing in on verse 7. We're also going to take a look at Zechariah chapter 14. So I know I've just given you a lot of scriptures. 1 Thessalonians 4, Matthew 24, 1 Corinthians 15, Revelation 20, Ezekiel 39, verse 7 specifically, and Zechariah chapter 14. 14. We will probably put in some other scriptures, but these are the main ones that I want you to know right off the bat. So there's no shame in turning to the table of contents ever. I make good use of the table of contents in my Bible, and that helps me find books of the Bible a little easier, um, especially ones like Zechariah that maybe I don't turn to on a daily basis. And so I want to give you a um, complete leeway to be able to do that as well. So Joel, will you pray us in and then we will get started with the teaching? Yeah. Um, Lord, we're so grateful uh, for a morning that we get to wake up um, and we just get to recognize um, your goodness. Um, some of us have seen the sunrise and uh, we can hear birds and um, we hear the activity that is around us. And um, Lord, we're just reminded that each one of those things that are happening around us is an indication that you're at work, um, that you are doing something, um, God, that you are not absent, but you are truly present. And so as we study your word, uh, we just pray that we would be encouraged, our hearts would be filled with the truth um, that you have given us your word uh, as another means to show that you are with us, that you are present. Um, and so we're so grateful for that. Uh, we pray that your spirit would give us clarity of mind and thought. Uh, and ultimately, Lord, we pray that um, people that are from different places, different backgrounds, different cultures, uh, would somehow miraculously be knit together by the power of your spirit. And we would leave uh, this time in your word unified um, and still uh, look to you for all of our hope uh, and all of our uh, joy and satisfaction. We trust you and we love you. Amen. Amen. Well, I know last week, Joel, you uh, took a deep dive into looking at the three major views of eschatology. Eschatology mm -hmm. means study of the end times. And so today I want to give quickly a review of what we talked about last week, but I want to do it in a very easy uh, bullet point format, really kind of a timeline so that as you are having conversations with your friends and your family and whoever else that the topic of end times might come up. I just want you to feel equipped and comfortable with the different views that are widely known today. So Joel, you're going to help me out with this yeah. because I'm still learning and I'm so excited to have you as my cheat sheet in case <laughs> I start to mess up here. Okay. So uh, let's go to, uh, and I've got my notes too, which is always incredibly helpful. All right, view number one is prehistoric, also called pre-millennium, right? Yep. Or pre-millennial. I always want to mess that up. Pre-millennial or pre-millennium? 
Um, the, it's a millennium, but when you're talking about the view, it's an ism, so pre-millennialism. But we can just say okay. pre premillennial. Okay, premillennial. Okay, so view number one, prehistoric, also referenced as premillennium. Oh, yeah, yeah you got it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and in this, uh, you have the Old Testament covenant. Okay, so you've got Old Testament. Then you have the birth, life, death resurrection and ascension of Jesus. So let's just form that. If you're writing a timeline, you've got the Old Testament, then you've got Jesus. So put a little cross there. Okay, then Jesus inaugurates the new covenant. And so we start moving into the uh, Pentecost era, which is Acts 2, right? Mm -hmm. And the church and all that happens that's described in Acts 2. Okay, so for this view, this is where we're going to start to see some um, distinctions here. Okay, now you have the tribulation. So if you're doing a timeline, you've got Old Testament, Jesus, Acts 2. Now you've got the tribulation. And this view is going to say that it is uh, that there's no rapture before or halfway through the tribulation, right? it's the, just the prehistoric the prehistoric one yes the prehistoric view that's the timeline we're building here so there's tribulation mm -hmm. then um there is the second coming of jesus and that second coming then you're going to experience a literal thousand year reign of jesus yep. and during that millennial reign joel that's where you're going to experience the judgment of revelation 19 and 20 is that right yeah so at the end of the millennial reign once you get to the end of it that's when you'll uh, experience the last judgment okay and they do see that at the second coming there's a literal thousand year reign which is the millennial reign mm -hmm. and then that ushers in after the judgment found in revelation 19 and 20 that issues in the new heavens and the new earth that's described in Revelation 21 through 22. Nailed it. Okay, so that is view number one. And let's let's put that in your notes as 1A. Yep. Because the pre-millennial view has two parts. It's the prehistoric is part A. Now, let's look at the pre-millennium uh, view B, which is called dispensationalism, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you've got the historic and the dispensationalism. Dispensationalism is view B. So you've got one A, one B, both premillennium, right? Yep. Okay, great. This one, if you're drawing a timeline in your notes, you've got the Old Testament, then you've got Jesus. So you've got the, the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus. All of that is the same. But then as the timeline goes on, before the great tribulation or before the tribulation, you've got the rapture mm -hmm. and the rapture for those of you who ever um, have watched the left behind series, either read the books or, um, or watched the movies, the rapture is where the saved are um, rescued or raptured out before the tribulation. Mm -hmm. So then, and you've got some people, just not to make this confusing, but in case you hear these terms, because someone asked a question about this last week, in the rapture, uh, you've got pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, which that designates different points where people believe inside this viewpoint when the rapture will occur. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. And obviously... For the theologians joining us today, they, this is such a high level view, but I, I want to just give the basics of these different views so that we can have them in our mind. Okay, so if you're in the dispensationalism camp, uh, again, you have the rapture, and then you have a seven year, some people believe it's three and a half years, but three and a half to seven years of the great tribulation. Mm -hmm. Then you have the second coming of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Then you have the thousand year reign. And to them, is that a literal thousand year reign? Yep. 
Okay, literal thousand year reign of Jesus. Then you have the great white judgment. Mm -hmm. And then you have the new heavens and new earth. Yep. Okay. Nailed Anything it. else you want to say about that? No, I mean, the main thing that you're going to notice that is different in between the prehistoric and the dispensational um, is just the indication of the, of the rapture, of a pre-tribulational rapture. Um, so yeah, really good. Great. Now we've covered the first pre-millennialism. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so part one and part two, prehistoric or the, the historic view and uh -huh. the um, dispensational view. Okay. Yeah. So now we're going to go to view big viewpoint number two, and that's post-millennial. Okay. So with the post-millennial, the, the people that would have been post-mill, post let's just say post-mill, would have been an example like the Puritans. Yep. This viewpoint is the least number of people now, the least held view now, um, as opposed to the other three major views that we're looking at. I think it's important for people to know that. But let's cover their basic timeline. Old Testament mm -hmm. and then Jesus. We've got the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. So that's the same as everything else we've discussed. Then um, after Jesus, you've got this almost this view that now the gospel is going out into the world and the world is getting better and better and better and better. So because Christianity is spreading throughout the world, you've got increasingly better economics, political, physical, social systems happening throughout the earth. And, and I love this because it's such a hopeful view. I think where the problems come in this viewpoint is it doesn't line up with really what is happening and what we see in the world. Um, so this is where there's some complications with this view, but um, you've got the earth getting better and better and better and better. Then you've got this golden age and in the golden age, it's really a culmination of the highlight of how much better everything has gotten because Christianity is now spread throughout the world, right? Yeah. Okay. Then after the golden age, you have the second coming and at the second coming is the judgment. And then after that, the second coming of Jesus, after this, what do they believe about the, the millennial reign? So the millennial reign is uh, figurative. Um, and so it, we're in the millennium and there is a sense of escalating goodness. The gospel is escalating. And so that's when you said the golden age, the golden age is this figurative millennial reign that's taking place. Um, it just is figurative. It's probably not a literal thousand years at the end of that golden age, the end of that millennial reign, uh, Jesus is going to come back with the second coming. Okay, so then you have the second coming of Jesus and then the judgment and the new heavens and new earth. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the second view, number two, uh, post mill. If you want to just make your notes a little easier. So you've got pre mill, post mill. Now, this third view is ah, just an A, mill, but Joel prefers instead of ah, millennialism. Um, is to call it the inaugurated or idealized millennialism view, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, because there's some, when you say ah, millennialism, you think that it kind of uh, complicates some of the good points of this view. Is, is that right, Joel? Yeah. And also literally ah, the A in front of it is a negation so if you read, if you read it literally, it means no millennium, but that's not what the, what the view is saying. I like to think that the uh, post-millennial and the pre-millennial uh, like original founders got together in a room and the amillennial was running late because he was grabbing coffee or something. And they're like, hey, we're just going to give him that name. Um, so, yeah. Or it could be that they're like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that's probably more likely. That's probably. <laughs> A little eschatology humor this morning, <laughs> too early. Okay, so let's go through the timeline for this one. You've got the Old Testament 
covenant. Then you've got Jesus. So in your timeline, you've got this exact same beginning, Old Testament to Jesus. Of course, you have the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. Now, the reason I keep pointing this out, because I want you to know those views that are main views of Christianity, those are the same. Mm. So you've got that Old Testament Testament covenant, and then you've got Jesus, Jesus's birth, life, death, resurrection, all of that is the same for all of these views. And I think as we're discussing this, that's a really important thing to notice because none of these views that we're talking about for end times are anti-Christian. So yeah. as we are having discussions about this, let's make it a lot less confrontational and, and a lot more conversational because we're keeping the main tenets of our faith they, they are all true for each one of these views. So I think that's really important. Okay, so back to our timeline, Old Testament, Jesus. And then as you're moving through, you've got the next thing on your timeline is the second coming and the judgment. And this thousand year reign is symbolic. Is that right, Joel? Yep. So it's not a literal thousand year reign. People who look at the scriptures see that the thousand year reign is a symbolic reign. And through the millennial reign, there is this already but not yet happening. Yeah. In other words, Jesus is already established, Joel, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you want to think about it, kind of like the election of the president of the United States. So when we have an election, we're in an election year. So the president, if we have a new president elected, then the election will take place and he is once the election takes place now that person is the president but the inauguration doesn't happen until january so he's already been elected but he's not yet seated in the oval office making those decisions and so if you want to think about that in terms of the already but not yet jesus jesus has already defeated death he is already um ruling as the king but he has not yet taken his seat to do all that needs to take place in revelation so the enemy has been defeated but the enemy is still active is that the right way to yeah yeah i think that's great i think a, a way to think about it is also is at the cross the death burial and resurrection of jesus when jesus ascends into heaven he ascends and he sits at the right hand of the father in the heavenly realms so, so right now, to your point, Lisa, Jesus is king. What that does is it sets a chain reaction in the earthly realm of saying there's an announcement that the king is here and the kingdom is here now. So just a really quick verse, uh, Luke chapter 17, verse 20, uh, the Pharisees are asking Jesus this exact question. They say, uh, and this is what Luke says, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them. The kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is or there. Uh, for behold, this is important. The kingdom of God is in the midst of you. So think, think about that. Jesus is saying the kingdom is here because I am here. I'm present. And it's the same thing when Jesus prays. He says on earth as it is, as it is in heaven. So we have this idea of an already, but a not yet. So Jesus has already been uh, seated at the right hand of the father. He's, he's already victorious, but he's not yet ruling and reigning on earth with yeah. the believers. Now, because he is in heaven, we see shadows of that here on earth. And, and the, the anticipation of his second coming is so great because we know uh, that Jesus, he's already uh, victorious, mm -hmm. but the final proclamation of victory uh, that's found when the new heavens and new earth are established and the enemy is thrown into the great abyss to be no more. Uh, we know that, that that is still coming. So that's what we mean by already, but not yet. Already victorious, but the final battle has not yet taken place. Yeah. And so then in this timeline, so Old Testament covenant, Jesus, this sense of already, but not yet, 
Then you have the second coming, the judgment. Then you have the new heavens and new earth, which you read about in Revelation 21 and 22, right? Yeah, and just a quick a quick thing on that. Notice in the, the, the distinction of this view is that in the first three that we talked about, the new heavens and the new earth are a final reality after the second coming of Jesus. Whereas the um, idealized or inaugurated millennial view, the, the all-millennial view, um, there is a sense that you and I are experiencing the first fruits of the new heavens, the new earth today. Um, we, we enjoy it because the spirit of God indwells inside of us. And so when we think about a passage like 2 Corinthians chapter 5, when Paul says that we're ambassadors of Christ and Christ has chosen to make his appeal to humanity in and through us, that term ambassador is a royal term that means that you and I, as lovers of Jesus, we carry the sign, the seal, the power, and the authority of the king himself. And so Jesus' chosen means to declare the goodness of the gospel to the earth is through us. And so if you went to India right now, um, where my family is from, and you went to the U.S. Embassy uh, in India, as soon as you walk into the U.S. Embassy, you're actually on U.S. soil technically, you know? Um, and I love the imagery that Paul is using in 2 Corinthians 5 in this place into the already but not yet. When he says that you and I are ambassadors, the places that we walk, the feet that our feet touch, um, it becomes a place of a representation of the power and the authority of the kingdom of heaven. Um, and so we, we feel a little bit of kinship to the post-millennial view in this of saying, oh my goodness, what an incredible opportunity that, that gives us. The gospel is spreading. And yeah. so in that sense, the earth is getting, uh, or the, the people, the Christians, the, because the good news is spreading, things are better. But we also know because there is still evil that is present, that there are that the earth is groaning, anticipating the the final declaration of victory where the enemy and the evil and the sin is no more. Yeah. And so there it, it's it's both and it's progressive things are progressively getting worse. And at the same time, in some sense, things are progressively getting better. So you can see now, Joel, did we miss anything about this? Or are we good with that? No, I think that's great. Okay. So you can now be equipped to talk intelligently and to have these conversations about these three different views. And of course, remember the pre-millennial view has two parts, the historic and the dispensational uh, view. Now, only the dispensational view, you notice when we talked about the timeline, has the rapture in it. And I know that this sense of weight I see what you're saying about the ah millennial view, but I am really messed up that you didn't include the rapture in that view. And if that's where you're at, can I just hit the pause button and say, I understand. I was telling Joel, I never knew before um, some of my opportunities to study in deeper ways and and, um, and, and really felt equipped to sit with people like Joel, who are so smart when it comes to the Bible. I never knew that there were any other views besides the dispensational view that includes the rapture. As a matter of fact, I told Joel, when I got married, uh, someone gave me a beautiful framed picture that gave instructions written in gorgeous calligraphy um, of what people should do if they encountered our home and we had all been raptured away. And it listed all the scriptures, many of which we're about to talk about. First Thessalonians chapter four, Matthew chapter 24, first Corinthians 15, Revelation 20, 21, 22. So it gave, listed out those verses and gave instructions. If you come to our home and we are not here, here's why. And so this view was so... Um, important to me. And it was so much a part of my Christian views. I thought that the rapture and believing in the return of Jesus were commingled or the same, so much so that if you take away the rapture, then it's almost heretical because to me, it, it took away something that was going to happen ushering in the second coming of Jesus. 
And so as I've studied the scriptures though, I've started to understand it's great if you truly, when you study the scriptures, you see the rapture, that's great, no problem. But if you study the scriptures and you start to get the sense that maybe the rapture isn't part of the timeline or doesn't happen in the way that it is, um, that you were always taught, then don't let it make you feel like the, the, um, the, the beliefs that you've had are falling apart. I, what I want you to do is just say, hey, let's just dig into the scripture and let's keep this in perspective that you can still be an amazing Christian who loves the Lord, who believes all the most important uh, tenets of the Christian faith and believe that the rapture is going to occur just like it was presented in the Left Behind series or like it's been talked about in lots and lots of churches. You can still be an incredibly solid Christian if you do not think that the rapture occurs in the way that it's taught. You can believe that the rapture occurs, but not in the pre-trib way. You can believe that it occurs in mid-trib. You can believe that it occurs post-trib. You can believe that the rapture may occur and that it doesn't exactly happen the way that people talk about it pre, mid, or post-trib. So I say all of that to say, let's just dig into the scriptures. Let's take the viewpoints and set them aside. And let's just see what the word of God says, because I think this is really important. Okay, Joel, let's turn to... Um, first, I want to read you something from Zechariah chapter 14, because um, I think this is going to give us a major viewpoint that all of the viewpoints will agree on. And that is when Jesus comes and all of these viewpoints believe in the second coming of Jesus, when Jesus comes, what is going to happen? So let's just look at this in Zechariah chapter 14. Uh, let's start on verse four, Zechariah 14, four on that day, on the day that Jesus returns, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Now here's what's so beautiful. Many scholars believe, and I believe it's supported in scripture that Jesus, he, he ascended from the Mount of Olives. And then he will return to the Mount of Olives. And for those of you who have been to Jerusalem, I want to give you a little orientation. The Mount of Olives is a very small mountain range. Don't think about, um, if you haven't been there, don't think about like big Colorado mountains. It's a very small mountain range. It consists of three peaks. So you have first over here, Mount Scopus. And as you're standing on Mount Scopus, you can actually scope out the city of Jerusalem. So you've got the Mount of Olives. It's a small mountain range here. Mount Scopus is the first peak. The second is the Mount of Olives. That's the middle. And the third is the Mount of Corruption, which is where Solomon, King Solomon, David's son, allowed his pagan wives to build places of false worship. And so that's the, the third part of the Mount of Olives. Across from the Mount of Olives, if you travel down the Mount of Olives, you'll go across the Kidron Valley and then up into the old city of Jerusalem. So I just wanted to give you that orientation. So Mount Scopus, Mount of Olives, Mount of Corruption. Um, at the bottom of the Mount of Olives, before you cross the Kidron Valley to go up into the city of Jerusalem, that's where the Garden of Gethsemane is, where Jesus spent those last hours before his arrest uh, before his mock trial, before his crucifixion. That is where Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. So I wanted you to have all of that in your mind. So picture all of that. Now it says in Zechariah, when Jesus returns, his feet will, uh, it says, on, verse four, on that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west forming a great valley. The uh, scientists have shown us that the Mount of Olives is already set up for this. They're actually tectonic plates, that the Mount of Olives is already designed perfectly for this to happen. And a lot of scholars believe that the part of the Mount of Olives that will split off 
is that Mount of Corruption where Solomon allowed his wives to build worship places for false, worshiping false gods, pagan gods. So I, I think that's pretty interesting that that will be split off. So the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley with half of the mountain moving north and half of the mountain moving south. So we do know that this will happen. When Jesus returns, he will return to the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives will split in two. We also know from other prophecies that the temple will rise, the, the reestablished uh, temple will rise, water will flow from the temple east and west, and the water that flows toward the Dead Sea will rush into the Dead Sea with such force that the Dead Sea currently, which is so salty, nothing can live in it, but the water from the temple rushing into the Dead Sea will wash away the death and that it will be teeming with life again. Mm -hmm. So those are things we see very clearly in scripture of what will happen when Jesus returns. We also know that every knee will bow and that it will be very, very clear. There will be trumpets. There will, there will be a great declaration and it will be very known. Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That will no longer be in dispute by anyone. Right, Joel? Yeah. Okay. So with that, um, that is that is solid. There's, there's no debate. No matter which um, viewpoint you're holding, the birth, death, death, the birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension of Jesus is true. Yeah. And the return of Jesus, like what I just read, is true. So it's the middle part where we want to go into the scriptures and find out where are the, the different ways of looking at some of the important scriptures. So Joel, I'll let you take it away as we turn to, where do you want to go first? First, this yeah. line. Yeah, let's actually start in Matthew 24. Uh, I'll okay. Make a little bit of context around that. And then we're going to turn to first Thessalonians. Um, before that, I think I want to, I want to just reorient our minds around this idea of suffering tribulation, hardship, um, which all of these positions when it comes to tribulation and hardship, there's a type of view in terms of what is God's um, uh, expectation or uh, feeling of his people and their uh, experiences with, with tribulation and suffering. And this is where I don't want to give my opinion. I just want to just go to the scriptures and say, let's look at what Jesus himself said. So if you go to John 16, 33, uh, Jesus says, I have said these things to you that in me, you may have peace. I, I think it's important that we identify where does the peace come from? It's union with Jesus. So in Christ, there is peace. And then this is what Jesus says in the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And you see right there is one of those perfect expressions of the already, but not yet. And we want to ask these questions like, Lord, how can you have overcome the world? But how can we still have tribulation in the world? And I think that category of already, but not yet um, is a bit helpful. And here's another one. I think this is super important. This is John chapter 17, as Jesus is, is, is what it's often called to as the high priestly prayer. If you have time, I just encourage you to read the entire chapter. My goodness, I think it's, it's an intimate moment between God the Father and God the Son. But I just want to point out in uh, verse 13, but now I'm coming to you. This is Jesus, but now I'm coming to you. And these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. This is so interesting. I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Verse 15, I do not, this is what Jesus is asking about the Father. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is true. Um, and so there's so many more, and I can give you more passages. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Romans 8, 8 18, um, 2 Corinthians 1, three through four. Okay. Hold on. You're going a little bit fast. Okay. First Corinthians 10, 15, Romans eight. First Corinthians 10, 13, 13. Okay. Romans, Romans 
8, 18. Okay. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. Okay. And then Romans 5, 3 through 4. And there's so many others. But I think it's important as we begin this conversation to just think, okay, what is the orientation? And I think the long story of scripture is not so much that um, we are saved from the tribulation or the wrath or the, or the consequences of sin, but rather in the midst of that tribulation, in the midst of that hardship, there's the promise of peace, which is the security of Jesus. And that is what we put our hope in. And so just, again, I want to give a big, broad stroke ideas. The story of scripture is so important. Um, for example, um, we're going to talk about this more, Noah and the flood. Noah doesn't um, uh, not experience the flood in a sense. I, again, one of the things that Lisa has taught me, uh, friends, is that we have to think about the human reality in the text, that there's the divinity and the humanity, and they have to work hand in hand. And so often we read like, oh my goodness, how amazing is it for Noah that he was saved from that? But I want to think about Noah and think, what would happen today if my neighbors, my friends, the people that I live life with, in a moment are swept away and they're gone and here I am saved. Uh, I think, yeah, I'm happy, but at the same time I'm experiencing sorrow. The reality that my house and the, the things that I've built, the, the fields that were to harvest, they're all gone. All of that has to be redone. So even in the story of Noah, we have this idea of, yeah, he was saved in a sense from the tribulation, He's on the earth, and now he's going to experience a new creation, a new earth, yet he still had to deal with the reality of a sense of loss. We see this with Abraham. Um, we see this with Israel in Egypt when they're in exile, uh, when they leave and they're saved. I mean, we continuously see the people when they're in the wilderness. The wilderness is a place of safety, and simultaneously, it's a place of suffering. That is mind-blowing how that can happen. Uh -huh. And I think that we see this throughout scripture. I know you and I have talked about the story of Joseph. So, you know, what, what is the major story of Joseph for those of you who have studied? And if you want to read the story of Joseph, go to Genesis 37. It culminates in Genesis 50 with this Genesis 50, 20. I love this verse. And I say it often that what you intended for evil, God has used for good for the saving of many lives. And so we see at that point in Joseph's life, Joseph is the second most powerful man in all of the, in all of Egypt. And some would say all of the world, mm -hmm. he is providing for uh, so many people. And yet he's not in his homeland. He's in Egypt. So he's in a foreign place. Life does not look like he thought it would. Now the dream that he had as a young boy, it did come to pass. He is absolutely placed in authority, not just over the people of Egypt, but also eventually his family. But Joseph still has this longing that he always wanted to go home. He, he always wanted to go back to his homeland, which after he dies, um, eventually uh, even the, the children of Israel carry Joseph's bones um, through the wilderness when they escape from Egypt. And eventually Joseph does get to go back to his homeland, but it definitely wasn't in the way he, that he thought. So was, were God's promises true? A hundred percent. Did Joseph get everything that he thought would come to pass? No, he didn't. Was God faithful? Yes. But did Joseph's story look exactly like he thought? No. Was Joseph spared from tribulation? Uh, yes and no. God was there. God rescued him. God protected him, but he still went through lots of hardships. And I think that's very true of our life as well. Absolutely. Um, so now with all that in context, let's turn to Matthew chapter 24. Today, I want to start in verse 15, but let me point out verse three. Um, verse three says that Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives. Um, I just love how the Mount of Olives shows up everywhere. Uh, but let's turn to verse 15. And I want to give a little background information. I remember Jesus is a Jewish man. Jesus is steeped in the Old Testament. Um, he's steeped in the prophecies. Jesus is simultaneously the divine son of God, 100% divinity and 100% humanity. This is a miracle in and of itself. 
what I believe Jesus often does is he applies a prophetic um, uh, mechanism, a prophetic kind of way. And I, I like to call it telescoping. It's kind of like having bifocal glasses. Um, you have the immediate, something's going to happen, close, immediate, right? But it's a shadow symbol sign framework and orientation of what's going to happen a long way off. Um, and Jesus actually gets this from the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel 22, Daniel 12. This is what the prophet Daniel is doing. He's saying there is an immediate fulfillment of a prophecy, and yet he's telescoping. He's also saying, but be on the lookout for a future fulfillment that's going to take place. So in uh, Matthew 24, verse 15, this is Jesus, and he says, uh, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, this is why I think Jesus is applying Daniel's mechanism. Standing in the holy place, talking about the temple, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation. Such as, has, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. For the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then he says, then if anyone says to you, look, here is Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if you say to you, so if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpses there, the vultures will gather. And then in verse 29, he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. The powers of heaven will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Pay attention to these, the, the phrasing. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So, Joel, why is there, why do you suggest the telescoping? Well, in BC 168, for the Jewish people, as they are listening to Jesus speak, in their minds, they're probably recollecting a story of a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, Antiochus Epiphanes was absolutely evil. Um, he did a lot of horrific things. One of the things that he did was he captured the temple. He captured Jerusalem. And when he came in, in the temple, he desecrated the temple. He actually took a pig, which is an unclean animal. Josephus, um, he, account, he has an entire account about this. And he sacrifices a pig on the altar of God. This is an absolute abomination. So this is where and so what you're saying, Joel, because I just I mean, I think this is where our minds can start to go. Whoa, 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 whoa. Too deep. Yeah. Too much. What are you talking about? I just want people to understand when Jesus is teaching this live to the people that were listening to him, they would have had in their mind this historical event yeah. that you're talking about, much like when we are listening to sermons we are pulling up connections to historical events that we've experienced. For those of us who experienced 9-11, mm -hmm. we, we just hear the words 9-11 and we have a whole point of reference of how hard, how, how devastating those days were. And we attach all of our emotion based on our experience to that event. So the people listening to Jesus here they would have thought about this historical event that you're referring to because it deeply affected and impacted the Jewish people. So just for those of us taking notes, because you know this so well, you're able to just up, 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 but, but just for the sake of yeah. my brain, and maybe for those of you listening, say the person's name again, that the Jewish people would have very much had in their mind this devastating historical event that took place before Jesus, I mean, you know, they would have thought about this because it took place in their history. Yeah, Antiochus, Antiochus, okay. Epiphanes. 
um, in his historical figure, uh, and you can probably Google him and read all about read read all about what took place. Why, why is this so important? Because when Jesus says uh, the like the the when so when you see the abomination of desolation, desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, there's an indication that there's a past reality that's going to shed light on a future coming, and now we're going to see the chain reaction of it. In AD 70, so 70 years after the, uh, around 70 years, uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, um, there is a uh, Roman general by the name of Titus. Titus rolls into the city of Jerusalem to conquer it. And as Titus rolls into the city of Jerusalem, he goes into the Holy of Holies and he desecrates the temple. In fact, the historian Josephus, who, who recounts all this stuff that's taking place, uh, and Lisa, we were, when we were filming for Trustworthy, we were um, in Israel, and we were around the temple, and we saw there is not a stone left on top of the stone. Like, it is total destruction. That is what um, uh, Titus had done. Here's an interesting fact. Josephus, and notice how Jesus says, um, some people are going to be on the rooftops, and they're going to be jumping and some people, like, it's better for women not to be pregnant in that time. This is what Josephus says. It's so interesting. He says, in that time when Titus comes in, a great many Jews die. Like, there, it was, it was so sad. But then he says something so unique. He says, but of the Jewish Christians, not many died. And he says, they were, they were seen, the Jewish Christians were seen jumping from rooftop to rooftop in escape. The and escaping through the valley that's the valley. often talked about here. Okay, so let's just hit the pause button again because the reason that you're referencing a historical event that people would have had in their mind when Jesus was teaching this, but you're also referencing something that happens in 70 AD that the people had not yet experienced, but Jesus is sitting in that space. He can see what was what is and what will be. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is also referencing 70 AD when Titus comes to destroy the temple. And when you keep referencing Josephus, because I just know when we've studied before, I've been like, whoa, 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 who yeah. is Josephus? And why do you keep referencing him? Yeah. He is a widely respected historian of the Jewish people that uh, that that count that that really put some detail to some of the history of Israel, the Jewish people, the experiences, and so this isn't Josephus isn't going to be found in the Bible, but it is a respected resource, the writings of Josephus, because he is an historian at the time. Yeah, um, and so that that's who you keep referencing, and this isn't something. To be nervous about we're not adding to scripture we're taking a look at what many theologians widely respected have looked at and that's also the history the counted history of the jewish people yeah i mean it's, it's the exact same thing that you and i do today with history where when we're reading about historical events we want to read all the literature and all the information around that time um, from different perspectives so that we can understand this is one of the ways that we can say that jesus is and was a historical figure. He wasn't just somebody who was made up because legitimate historians around that time refer to him. Um, so yeah, that's super important. Now, here's, here's where we're driving towards. Notice that there is this fulfillment in AD 70, but then in verse 29, Jesus says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. And he talks about the return of himself, of, of Jesus. So here we see that telescoping effect. We see that there is an immediate fulfillment that's going to happen in just, you know, 70, 80 years or so. But this is a marked moment in order to let the believers know that there is a time that is going to come similar to these types of events where Jesus is going to come back. But when he comes back, notice the language. He's going to come out of heaven with the clouds, with power and great glory. And then he's going to send his angels out to the four corners, that, that's a symbolism for the entire earth, and he's going to bring everybody to himself. And then we get to Matthew 36. In those days, uh, in that day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven or the Son, but the Father, as were the days of Noah. And we talked about this last week, 
Um, and then the parallel passages that I know some questions came up were, well, Joel, what about Luke 17, 20 through 35? It talks about Lot uh, there. What about Mark chapter 13? These are uh, what's referred to as synoptic gospels. They are the disciples that are looking in at a um, particular story from different points of views, right? And Joel, when you say synoptic gospels, you mean it's the same story being told from different disciples and of course in the gospels matthew mark luke and john so yeah. when you say synoptic it means that it's the telling of the same event from a different person's viewpoint so there may be more or less details included in different viewpoints yeah and i think one of the important things as we read this it says in verse 38 for as in those days before the flood they were eating and drinking marrying and giving in marriage until the day when noah entered the ark and then they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. When Jesus says the flood came and swept them all away, again, remember, he's using language to elicit response from people, especially the Jewish people at the time. When that phrase swept them all away uh, is said, is uttered, they're thinking about the Red Sea. They're thinking about their uh, forefathers and mothers and, and their ancestors who escaped Egypt and God in judgment of the Egyptians as they're in the middle, the waters come in and, and, and sweep them all away. In the story of Lot, we see the same thing in Luke chapter 20. Um, the story of Lot is about a remnant of people who are saved, but the larger story is about judgment. And again, Lot is experiencing the tragedy along the way, though he is saved. And so the larger narrative here um, is about a type of judgment for those that are not lovers of Jesus, that don't submit to his kingship and to his rulership, and simultaneously God's sweet mercy in how he saves, but his saving of the people is not to, at this point here in this text, it doesn't seem to take them away, but it is to an experience a new heavens and a new earth. And so um, Isaiah 65, 17, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. Isaiah 66, 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your offspring and you, your name remain. Um, in the New Testament, this idea of new heavens and new earth shall up, that's what Revelation 21 uh, and 22 is all about. Second Peter 2, 3 and 2 Peter 3.13. So the idea is that there is a new heavens and a new earth and humanity is supposed to experience the joy and the beauty of this new heavens and new earth, which is an image at, uh, of Garden of Eden, the very first um, uh, beautiful garden city. Now, a lot of you are thinking, okay, this is really great, but what about uh, the rapture? And it seems like in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter four, it seems very clear that Jesus comes and he raptures uh, his people away. So let's look at verse 13. Um, okay. Now, while everyone's turning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, I just want to wrap up. If you missed last week, I went in a little bit more detail about why the context of the story of Noah mm -hmm. is really important when it comes to what Jesus is teaching here. So what, basically, if you missed last week, I want you to go back and watch it, but I want you to understand what Joel is getting at here. And that is because Jesus is saying in the last days, when I return, I want you to think about what happened in the story of Noah. Noah wasn't taken away. So the saved one, the one that honored God, the one that believed God's instructions and he was obedient, he built the ark. He was rescued, but it wasn't by putting him in the ark and taking him away. It was, he was his rescue was by being put in the ark, kept saved, but he never leaves earth. Mm. Um, th the ones that are taken away were the unsaved to, um, to rid the world of the evil that could not stay. And so I just think that that there's two things happening here. Jesus is setting the context around the story of Noah to give us a picture, though we will not know the hour, the time, no one knows, only the father knows that. We can see a picture 
if we look at the story of Noah, of what will be on the day when Jesus returns. So I just think, I just wanted to make sure that people kind of got that before yeah. we move on. And we only have a few minutes left, but let's look over at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Yeah, so the context of 1 Thessalonians chapter chapter 4 is the church in Thessalonica is super stressed out because some of the people that they love, a part of their church, their own family members have died. And remember, they are hopeful that Jesus is going to come back as ruling, reigning king. And every time the Thessalonians see a general or a Caesar march into the city and everybody goes out to celebrate them, it's kind of like um, a real rude, almost slap in the face for them. And they're longing for the day when Jesus is going to come back where they can experience this great celebration. They're worried and stressed out that those that have died are going to miss out on the great party. This is where Paul says, I'm going to answer that. Uh, and Paul gives an assurance in verse 13. He says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, circle that word coming, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will first rise. When we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. That's the Greek word harpazo, which means to, to be caught up. We'll be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet. Circle that word meet, the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. And he says, therefore, encourage uh, one another with these words. This is a snapshot of what Paul is kind of getting at. And one of the things when we're studying scripture is we want to study the words the context, the historical and social setting. What Paul is doing is he's actually combining a bunch of different metaphors. So the first one is Moses, who's descending from Mount Sinai. Um, we find this in Exodus 16.10 and in Exodus 19.9. In both of these images, there, uh, there's a reference to the, the cloud which is the glory of God. It's a, it's a symbolism for the glory of God. So we see the clouds of heaven. The next one is Daniel chapter seven, which talks about the son of man. And in that passage, again, it talks about the son of man who appears in the clouds. So we see uh, that combination. And here's the third one. It is a, it is a um, symbolism of the Roman empire and of uh, people's responsibility to welcome uh, people of position and status, right? So the so word it could be like that they, they would have known that when a politician, a person of great social status, or even a conquering general yes. or someone walking in some victory, when they come to town, the people go out to meet them, celebrate their coming, and then invite them into the town as a special guest. Yeah, so the big question we're asking here is, what is the direction that's taking place? Jesus is coming from heaven, and then he uh, harpazos the people, he catches the people up in the cloud to be with Jesus, so they're in the presence and the glory of, of Jesus, but then is Jesus making a U-turn and going back to where he came from? And if we didn't have some of this language uh, and history information, it would be so easy to see yeah, he can easily be coming, saving, and taking away. And that's kind of where we get this idea of the rapture. A couple of quick notes. Does Jesus' feet ever touch the earth? In this illustration or in this uh, text, it, we don't have indication of that per se. But I do want us to uh, be reminded of Acts chapter uh, 1, where the angels tell the disciples that this Jesus who just left you, and the description is Jesus was laughed away and the clouds departed. They, they covered his, uh, his entrance, his exit. Uh, he's going to come back in the same way. This word cloud that's used here is the exact same Greek word that's used in Acts chapter 1 in, in multiple places. And uh, what you're referring to in Acts chapter 1 is Jesus's ascension. So when Jesus, you know, remember we have the, the birth, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus then we have the ascension of Jesus, where Jesus ascends from his resurrected body being here on earth 
into heaven from yeah. the earth. So that same word that when Jesus's ascension for the clouds is also found found here. So it only makes sense that the clouds would also usher his return. His return. And then three descriptive realities of his return in verse uh, 16, a cry of command, the voice of an archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God. Um, this seems to be a worldwide event. <laughs> It seems to be something that everybody's going to be able to pay attention to because of how spectacular it is. Now, a couple interesting things. The word coming in verse 15 is the Greek word parousia. Parousia, which is where we get end times from uh, or second coming from. Okay, so look back at verse 15. And in that, I'm reading out of NIV. Joel's reading out of ESV. But mm -hmm. just underline those four words, coming of the Lord. And the, the original language in the Greek that is used there before it was in, interpreted into English is parousia. And Joel, will you spell that for us? Yeah, it's P-A-R-O-U-S-I-A, parousia. Um, and this is a technical term. I just want to point out I, the stuff that I'm saying, it's not just stuff that I've made up. This is... Um, theologians from the early church fathers up to modern brilliant theologians like N.T. Wright and G.K. Beale and others um, have, have made these historical observations. This word parousia and then also in verse 17 where it says the people are caught up that's the harpazo caught up is harpazo but then just a few words after that it says to meet the Lord in the air. The Greek word uh, meet is apentisin a-p-a-n-t E-S-I-N. Something really interesting. This word is only used three times in the New Testament in this exact way. It's used in Matthew 25, verses 1 and 6. This is the parable of the virgins who meet the bridegroom. And it's used in Acts 28, 15, in reference to Paul returning uh, and to a group of friends, a group of uh, church members, brothers, uh, going out to meet Paul. What does this mean? Uh, in Greek literature, this word, apentisin and parousia, it is a technical term that's used to describe an advanced welcoming party. Um, and so the idea that we have here seems to be, based off of the text, that the people who are caught up, we're caught up into the heavens in a sense of the same way Jesus' triumphal entry. We're going to go out there and we're going to welcome in the ushering king. I think it's really compelling also to say, okay, well, in Matthew 25, the parable of the 10 virgins, the, um, the women, they don't go out to welcome the bridegroom in and then leave to a different location. It's actually being used to say they go out and they welcome him back in to the feast, to the wedding feast that's there. That's the same thing that's happening with Paul. So the usage of these words seem to indicate that the direction of Jesus is he's going to be welcomed but then he's going to continue to come to earth and establish his reign and rule. This seems to be a passage about Jesus' second coming um, when he's going to right all the wrongs. Joel, thank you so much for taking us deeper into the text. And obviously, we've got some more verses to cover. We've only gotten to Matthew chapter 24, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which is what we just did. Um, we've still got a few others. So we will do a part three of this just so you have access to be able to study the scriptures with us and unpack these in a way that you have access to them when you're talking about end times. But I want to end with this in building on what Joel just said. I want you to think about what people are experiencing when they're welcoming back the victorious uh, conquering king. So they are in great anticipation of his arrival. Mm -hmm. They all feel the sense of victory. Uh, they are excited when they see him. They go out to meet him and they are familiar with him. They know who he is and they join in the celebration that is a declaration and a proclamation of victory. And so I want you to know the second coming of Jesus is something to be looked forward to. It is gonna be a moment where we all participate in the great victory of Jesus. And it is something that is going to be um, very, very clear 
We're not going to be confused. Like, could this person be Jesus or that person be Jesus? Scripture makes it very known to us that, that when Jesus returns, um, it is going to be very, very clear. And for those of you who have ever had a moment where you thought, um, I don't know that I ever have had a marked moment where I have declared that Jesus Christ is the Lord of my heart, then you may have some wondering or maybe even some uncertainty or fear when you hear us teaching about the excitement of Jesus's return. And I want you to know that it is absolutely possible to have that marked moment and to have that great certainty where you say, I know that I have believed in my heart and profess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if you've not had that marked moment, I want to end today by giving you that opportunity because you don't have to go tidy up your life or make different choices or have some seminary degree or have logged a certain number of hours in reading the Bible. Um, Jesus says this is a gift. It's his gift of salvation. And so it really is the most beautiful thing for you to just receive the gift and how you receive the gift is to say, I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is the son of God sent to forgive me of my sins by dying on a cross to take my place for the punishment of the sin so that I don't have to live in fear of that punishment. That if I believe Jesus Christ is the son of God sent to die on a cross and then he rose again, he set me free from the weight and the condemnation of my sin. I am no longer condemned when I believe that Jesus Christ, I receive his gift of salvation, that he's the son of God and that he is my Lord and my savior. I receive this gift. I believe it in my heart. I confess it with my mouth. And so in that, when we pray that prayer, we can stand assured that we are saved. So let me just end by praying the prayer. And uh, for those of you who are believers, just repeat after me as an affirmation for those who are praying this uh, for the very first time. And we'll end with this. Jesus, I acknowledge that you are the son of God sent to live on this earth, to die by crucifixion. And yet you didn't stay dead. I believe you rose again. You set me free from all of my sins. I ask that you forgive me that you heal me and that you show me how to live every day, proclaiming that Jesus, you are my Lord. You are my savior. You are the king of my heart. I believe in you. I receive your free gift of salvation and I will live the rest of my life following you, telling other people about you. Thank you for this free gift of salvation. I am now forevermore saved. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you, friends, for joining us for this teaching, Jesus in the End Times. Again, um, I just celebrate the gift that we have in living in a day and a time where we can study God's word. I celebrate those of you who prayed this prayer for the very first time. You can walk knowing with great assurance that Jesus Christ is your Lord. And when Jesus returns, because he will, no one knows the hour, no one knows the day, no one knows the time. But when he does return, you will welcome him 
as your victorious king with no fear, with great anticipation. And um, not only that, but not just living for that day, but living in that reality today, that because of Jesus, you can have a different sense of peace, a different sense of joy, because simultaneously, whatever you're facing here on earth, you know that Jesus has said, just like Joel gave us the verse, John 16, 33, go and read that, that, that Jesus has given you a different kind of assurance, a different kind of peace that you can take heart. He is overcoming the world and all of the tribulations and hardships and sorrows that we are experiencing, but we can carry with us the reality of Jesus into all of that. Again, the notes for um, a guide to end times. So that we want to make available free to you. It's pinned right at the top in the comments here. So you can have access to that. It's our gift to you. It's a free download from Proverbs 31 Ministries. Joel, thank you for your teaching. We'll be back next week and we'll jump into some of these other verses. First Corinthians 15, we'll get a little more into Revelation as well. Have a great week. God bless you. And um, go in the peace of the Lord, because Jesus is available. His peace is available to you personally today. God bless you. Yeah.